Hey, this is Henry, and you probably won't be surprised to hear that I've recently been thinking a bit more about epidemiology than physics. When I see daily news reports on COVID-19, it's really difficult for me to build a coherent picture of what's actually going on, because the numbers are changing so quickly, which is exactly what you'd expect with exponential growth, that they're almost immediately out of date. We know that epidemics tend to grow exponentially at first, and also that exponential growth is really, really hard for our human brains to understand because of just how crazily fast it is. My friend Grant Sanderson of 3 Blue One Brown has a great overview video about exponential growth, which I highly recommend. But regarding the news, I'd rather know where we're headed and if we're making detectable progress. Are we winning or losing? Because of course, we can't have exponential growth forever. At some point, the disease will run out of new people to infect, either because most people have already been infected, or because we as society managed to get it under control. But, and this is the scary part to me, when you're in the middle of an exponential, it's essentially impossible to tell when it's going to end. Are we in for 10 times as many cases as we currently have? Or 100 times as many? Or 1,000? Exactly when exponential growth ends is important, because it hugely determines how many people fall ill, yet so little reporting actually focuses at all on how to tell if exponential growth is ending. After talking about this with my friend Atish, he put together a new graph visualizing the COVID-19 epidemic on a global scale. This graph uses the real data and shows all countries traveling along the trajectory of exponential growth, and it makes it super obvious which ones have managed to stop the exponential exponential spread of disease. They plummet downwards off the main sequence in a way I find super compelling. And this figure also makes it abundantly clear that even if a country doesn't have lots of cases right now, COVID-19 is probably going to follow the same trajectory there and end up spreading and spreading and spreading until that country hits the emergency eject button. If you're planning for the future and your country doesn't have a lot of cases yet, it's nevertheless a safe bet that you're probably headed down a similar path. So how did we make this graph? Well, there are three key ideas. The first is to plot on a logarithmic scale, since that's the natural scale for exponential growth. Note that the tick marks grow by multiples of 10, so 10, 100, 1000, rather than 10, 20, 30. This scales up small numbers and scales down large numbers, making the growth equally apparent on all scales, and lets us compare the growth in countries with very different numbers of cases. Which brings us to the second idea, catch changes early by looking at change itself. For example, if you look at the growth of cases in South Korea, you can see that at first they're exponential and later the growth slows down. But when you're halfway up this curve, it's hard to tell by eye that it is slowing down. It kind of still looks exponential. If instead you chart the number of new cases in the last week, in other words, the rate of growth, it's much easier to see that the growth is indeed starting to slow down. And when the number of new cases each week flattens out or goes down, you've escaped the scary exponential growth zone. The third idea behind our graph is one from physics. Don't plot against time. Usually, when you see exponential growth, the number of cases is plotted versus time. But the spread of the disease doesn't care if it's March or April. It only cares about two things, how many cases there are today, and how many new cases there will be today. That is, the total number of infections and the growth rate of infections. The defining feature of exponential growth is that the number of new cases is proportional to the number of existing cases, which means that if you plot new cases versus total cases, exponential growth appears as a straight line. So these are what we plotted on our graph. The number of new cases, aka the growth rate, is on the y-axis, and the cumulative number of cases is on the x-axis, both on logarithmic scales. This gives us a beautiful, horrible graph that shows where all countries are in their COVID-19 journeys. It makes it obvious that the disease is spreading in the same manner everywhere. We're all headed on the same trajectory, just shifted in time. And it makes it obvious where public health measures like testing, isolation, physical distancing, and contact tracing have started to beat back the disease and where they either aren't working or haven't had time to show up in the data. In nearly every country so far, the number of cases grows at basically the same rate, until it doesn't. And that's what I feel like is missing from so much COVID-19 coverage, a sense of whether or not we can see the light at the end of the tunnel. Are we still on the rocket ship of contagion, like the US? Or have we managed to hit the emergency eject button, like China? And this graph shows us that. It gives us some sense of what's actually happening in these uncertain times. That said, this graph also has a number of caveats and limitations. Its main goal is to emphasize deviations from exponential growth, that is, to amplify the light at the end of the tunnel, so it may be less informative for other purposes. So here are the caveats. 10,000 looks really close to 1,000 on a log scale. This kind of distortion might allow people to take COVID-19 less seriously. Also, the log scale on the x-axis makes it harder to see a resurgence of new infections after a significant downturn. A plot with a linear x-axis is better for that. Unlike most other COVID-19 graphs you've probably seen, time isn't on the x-axis, which might be confusing. Instead, time is shown through an animation. 
Another important caveat is that this graph, and basically every other COVID-19 graph you've seen, isn't actually showing the true number of cases, just the number of detected cases. The true number of cases is unknown, but certainly much higher than the number detected. In reality, COVID-19 cases spread at a slower rate than what this data implies. It's kind of a subtle idea, but this data reflects not just increases in case numbers, but also increases in the number of tests performed. And since we're ramping up tests, it makes it look like the cases are growing faster than they actually are. But they're still growing. The data we're using is incomplete, as it relies on daily reports from overburdened healthcare systems around the world. Also, different countries have dramatic differences in the resources that are available and dedicated for testing. Finally, the trends in this plot are delayed a few days, since we're plotting the average growth rate over the last week. There's just too much variability in the data to plot daily growth rates. This is actually kind of a good thing. It means it's a pessimistic graph. It doesn't get too excited too soon, and so a downward trend on the graph is much more likely to be a real downward trend. And a real downward trend is what we want, for all countries. A lot of daily news just reports recent data points. Yet to understand where we're headed, it's not enough to know just where we are today. We need to be talking about trends. How many new cases are there today relative to the number of new cases yesterday, or last week? Charting the rate of change empowers us all to more clearly see what the future holds. A giant thanks to Atish Bhatia, who created the interactive visualization and helped write this script. Atish's work on this has been a beacon to me in these hard times. And this video was made possible by Brilliant.org, which, I don't know if you know anybody who's looking for interactive online math and science resources right now, courses, practice problems, daily puzzles, but Brilliant.org is the place to go. They cover lots of K-12 and college-level subjects, ranging from fundamentals of algebra to calculus to differential equations, and of course they have a section on exponential and logistic growth. The first 200 people to go to Brilliant.org slash Minute Physics will get 20% off an annual premium subscription to Brilliant that gets you full access to all of Brilliant's courses, quizzes, and puzzles. If you've got somebody who's out of school right now because of the pandemic, Brilliant is really a great place to go for math and science. Again, that's brilliant.org slash minutephysics, and thank you to Brilliant for their continued support.